today we would discuss left to right shunts this is a term that you hear often enough it's important for us to understand what is meant by the left to right shunt what are the common conditions which are associated with left to right shunts how do you diagnose them and what is the management and what is the appropriate timing of that management so we are referring to a group of conditions where left sided blood reaches the right side now what is peculiar about the left sided blood it is fully saturated therefore the blood that goes into the lung is not only the venous blood that comes into the heart from the vena cavae but also the fully saturated blood from the pulmonary venous return that is crossed on to the right side at some point the result the flow to the lung is more than the flow to the body the conditions that would come under this category the common ones are asd vsd pda you must also remember av canal defect which contains a large asd and a large vsd pulmonary window which like a vsd there is a communication between the left and right hearts below the tricuspid valve but it just happens that it is above the semilunar valves there are uncommon conditions like coronary arteriovenous fistula or a rupture of the sinus vessel valve into the right heart which also will come under this category i will not be discussing those because they are not essentially pediatric problems rarely you may find a coronary av fistula in an infant though So the com common features are you have the oxygenated blood. Left is for oxygenated. It is entering cardiac chamber on the right side. As a result, the pulmonary blood flow is increased. Check the saturation of the kidney; it is normal. If the flow is distal to the tricuspid valve. the heart has very little time in terms of weeks and months to adapt to this extra flow and the child goes into heart failure so we say that post tricuspid shunts post tricuspid shunts are vsd pda the ventricular component of the av canal defect and an ap window in all these conditions there is heart failure in pre tricuspid shunts notably atrial septal defect heart failure is not a feature because the shunt is established over a long period of time if you look at the newborn the newborn needs to face the shunt in a matter of several months or perhaps a few years and the right side can enlarge to accommodate the flow therefore it does not face any challenge so an asd ordinarily does not cause heart failure let's start by describing asd which is a very common congenital heart defect and um, how does a pediatrician come across an asd you are examining the child for vaccination or the child has come to you with a febrile illness and on auscultation you hear a murmur the more perceptive among you may notice that the second sound is widely split the first question that the cardiologist is asked when an asd is diagnosed will this close by itself because we are mentally tuned to holes which will close by themselves the question is relevant if you are dealing with a newborn in a newborn if the defect is less than 8 mm it is a fair chance i would say even a 50% chance of closure in the next one or two years but if you are seeing a 2 year old child or a 3 year old child with a 5 mm defect it is very unlikely that it will close so closure is likely with smaller defects seen in the neonatal period in older children older as in at 2 years or 3 years even they do not close you quite often see the term patent foramen ovale or pfo what is this it's a valvular opening between the septum primum and the septum secundum a remnant of what was happening in the fetus and um, you diagnose it in the postnatal period when you find a small valvular opening between the two septa with a small defect and um, this is a valvular or flap like opening characteristically there is no enlargement of the ra or rv in this condition a significant asd is associated with ra and rv enlargement and when you see a newborn you must expect a pfo it's a normal finding and 
And um, what's your concern regarding an AST? Symptoms may develop as age advances. Over the age of 40, rarely earlier. Yeah? Atrial pneumonias tend to occur. Very rarely, an AST can enlarge on follow-up. In AST, what you have seen at the age of um, two years, you may find that as the RA enlargement uh, increases, the, it may stress the margins of a defect, and um, you find that it doesn't close. Uh, no, the, on the one hand, it doesn't close, but on the other hand, it's becoming larger. Therefore, uh, say we, when you're contemplating device closure at the age of two, we would rather do it in a borderline case at that age rather than wait, because when you wait, the defect may actually become larger. And when you close an ASD, it has to be done in childhood. If you close the ASD in childhood, you have a normal heart for the kid, and you can treat the child as a child with a normal heart. And if there is a large ASD and you do not treat the child, there is a significant reduction in life expectancy, which will be appreciated in the latter part of the child's adult life. Look at the ASDs, which are the uh, defects that you see. If you can follow this cartoon, this is the RA. Here is the superior vena cava. Here is the inferior vena cava. And uh, this is the, the flap of the fossa ovalis. A defect which which is centrally located is a second M defect. And um, a defect which is located towards the SVC, actually between the SVC and the right upper pulmonary vein, will be called a sinus venosus defect. And a defect which is located between the septum primum and the uh, AV valve tissue, here it will be called a ostium primum defect. Rarely a sinus venosus defect can occur in relation to the inferior vena cava also, and uh, that will be called an IVC type of sinus venosus defect. Having said that, the common defects that you deal with are either second defects or a primum defects, and um, perhaps sinus venosus defect also. You're seeing a child. How do you evaluate a child with an AST? Mind you, you don't expect any symptoms. But if you look at the child, you find that the weight gain has been slow for this kid. The commonest symptom or um, sign, if you may, that you elicit in a child with ASD is that there is a subnormal weight. And you close that ASD by whichever means. And in the next one year, if you see the weight gain, you find that it is dramatically improved relative to the year prior to closure. Occasionally, an older child may complain of exertional palpitation Paroxysmal palpitation marking an arrhythmia or exertional dyspnea is a feature of older adults. We said the weight gain is slow, and uh, as a result, most ASD children are thin. We used to say that they have a gracile, thin habitus. The habitus changes once you close the ASD. On examination, the heart is enlarged. You find that the apex beat is shifted out. There are prominent left parasternal pulsations. The first sound is normal. The second sound is wide and fixed. The P2 is loud. There is a short pulmonary ejection systolic murmur. And there is a tricuspid mid-diastolic murmur representing increased flow through the tricuspid valve. The auscultatory hallmark is the wide and fixed split of the second sound. It is wide because the RV has to deal with a much larger volume during its systole than normal. It's fixed because there is a reciprocal variation between what happens through the inspiration in, um, uh, on one side and what happens from the left to right shunt on the other side. In inspiration, as the venous return is increasing to the heart, the left to right shunt decreases. In expiration, as the venous return is decreasing, the left to right shunt increases. Therefore, what the RV receives is the same amount. Therefore, the ejection remains the same and uh, the, the interval between the A2 and the P2 is the same in inspiration and expiration. This is what you call by a fixed split. An X-ray, if you see, 
It's common to find cardiomegaly due to RV and RA enlargement. The particular X-ray that you're seeing does not show cardiomegaly, which also is not uncommon. Many moderate sized ASTs do not have a cardiomegaly on the X-ray because much RV RA enlargement detectable on echo can be concealed by the radiology. You'll find in this particular X-ray some a mild increase in the pulmonary arterial markings with a normal sized heart, but the main pulmonary artery segment is convex here and the RPA LPA are prominent and some increase in the vascularity. Quite often, say a three year old, four, four year old child with a 10 mm ASD, this X-ray will go with it. If you look at the ECG, what you expect in the ECG is RV volume overload. And what is the ECG marker of RM, RV volume overload? It's an incomplete right bundle branch block and also a right atrial enlargement. Right atrial enlargement is a different finding. RV volume overload is manifested as an incomplete right bundle branch block. Some of the older examiners have found the word crochetate sign, which is notched R waves in 2, 3 and AVF. If you see here, there is a subtle notching which is best seen in the lead 3 and also in the AVF, <clears throat> this is a feature of a large left to right shunt. But much of our diagnosis will depend on echo. The common features of ASD on echo, the RA and RB are enlarged. IVS has a paradoxical movement. The IVS doesn't move with the LV, it moves with the RV. MPA and branches are dilated. RV and PA pressures are normal when you estimate it with a tricuspid regurgitation Doppler or a pulmonary regurgitation Doppler. And then we need to identify the defect. Regardless of the location, whatever we said so far is common to all ASDs. So this is a subcostal bicaval view. You can see the atrial septum and the, the edges of the defect on one side of the screen and the color flow through that on the other side. We make this diagnosis and then you're faced with a question. When do you want to close? Do you want to close this? If there is an RV RA enlargement, you should close an ASD. Any ASD with an RV RA enlargement, unless of course there is pulmonary hypertension, you need to close the ASD. And you close it between two and four years of age. Now, all the recommendations that I give, this is based on a national consensus meeting for India, which we convened at the Old Institute of Medical Sciences in August last year, and uh, which is either already published or is in the way to publication, both in Indian pediatrics and in Indian Heart Journal. So all that is why the uh, words like class one, class two, and all because the a national consensus meeting of Indian pediatric cardiologists recommend the, these guidelines. So an asymptomatic child is two to four years. For a sinus venosus defect, many surgeons like to operate a little later because uh, there are patches involving the superior vena cava and the right upper pulmonary vein. And many surgeons feel that there is a chance of stenosis in these regions. Uh, the uh, surgeons that I work with have not agreed with this and they have produced excellent results without that. But the general recommendation, there is no harm in victim for five years. And very rarely you find a infant congestive heart failure and some pulmonary hypertension. In any large uh, unit, you will find two or three uh, excuse me, I should uh, warn the listeners that there is a lot of feedback which is coming in. So please turn off your mic and please avoid talking yourself because it is coming to me as a feedback. Please stop. So we are speaking of symptomatic ASD in infancy, which is uncommon, but occasionally we come across this and then we close it regardless of the age. You could close it with a device, you could close it with surgery. But the, the caveat is, if you are thinking that an infant is symptomatic due to an ASD, exclude a total anomalous pulmonary venous connection or an obstruction within the left atrium, driving the shunt and worsening it. Uh, this happens in cotra atria. So you must be looking for uh, some of these situations or an additional shunt like a PDA or an AP window 
before you conclude that an ASD is responsible for heart failure. But as I said, uncommonly it does happen in infancy and um, say I would see one or two such cases every year. How do you close it? Surgical is the established mode, but today the standard of care is device closure. Device closure is only for second MASD. Uh, it is used if only certain uh, things are excluded where there is a higher likelihood of complications. The device needs margins to adhere to. So if the rims are deficient, the generally do not go for device closure. In a small weight baby, we generally do not for, for device closure. In a very large defect, we generally do not go for device closure. I keep on adding that generally as my adjective, but there are specific instances where we deliberately and safely override these restrictions. You do have some atypical situations with regard to ASD. If ASD is presenting beyond the ideal age, that is, um, you're not seeing a five-year-old child. You're finding it like um, I right now has a young lady, 20 years, uh, scheduled for ASD closure. What is the ideal time for closing it? As soon as you find it, as soon as it is possible to um, conveniently schedule that case, it should be done. But whenever you are finding an older person, you may need to be certain, one, there's significant right heart volume overload. How do you make that out? RARV enlargement, cardiomegaly on chest X-ray, increased pulmonary vascularity. And uh, if there is any evidence of pulmonary hypertension, we need to look at the pulmonary vascular resistance critically and be certain that it is within the operable range. That might entail a catheterization. But in India, it is very common to find adults uh, or adolescents with large ASDs, no pulmonary hypertension uh, presenting to us and um, undergoing closure. Why old adults? We have uh, enough uh, people in their 60s and 70s undergoing that. Another atypical presentation is paradoxical embolism causing stroke or a TIA. Uh, I would recall a 40-year-old ophthalmologist who came to me because she was to undergo a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. When carbon dioxide was insufflated inside the abdomen, she got a stroke. And... Um, this is the type of presentation an older adult might actually get into due to paradoxical embolism. It's actually more likely to happen with a, a PFO and an atrial septal And once you have closed an ASD surgically, you do a clinical and echo follow-up in the first year. There's no further follow-up required if there is no residual disease or pulmonary hypertension. And when you see such a child, a child who has undergone uh, ASD closure one year ago, it's coming to you with a, a fever or a, uh, a breathlessness after two years, there's nothing which is related to the heart. You have to find the cause elsewhere. Don't think that there's a post op child, so there must be something wrong with the heart. No, ASD, once it is closed, you have a normal heart. You do recommend infective endocarditis prophylaxis for six months. Or, or uh, it's also the, uh, the after surgical closure or device closure, you recommend infective endocarditis prophylaxis for six months. However, uh, it is a good practice that anybody who has had a cardiac surgery maintains good oral and dental hygiene. If you are doing a device closure, you give aspirin for six months in all patients. And in older patients with a very large defect, you combine it with uh, clopidogrel in the first three months, uh, especially in an adult. Remember, when there is a device, the device is metal. This metal is exposed to the left atrium and eventually it will endothelialize. It is believed that this happens within three to six months. So during the three to six months period, there's always a risk that a platelet could adhere to the left atrial surface and could be a cause for thromboembolism. That is why you give aspirin for six months in all patients and uh, add clopidogrel in older patients in the first three months. Device patients require follow-up, uh, I would say infinitely. You should definitely see in a, during the first year frequently, then maybe even uh, every three to five years we need to see. So this is a, an echo of a patient with a device. You can see it's a large device. 
it's a device which is sitting here but otherwise the heart is fine we refer to the sinus venosus defect clinically it is exactly like an asd uh, what i tell my residents is that when you have clinically diagnosed asd you find all echo features of asd except that you can't find it think of sinus venosus defect what is the difficulty in finding it you need a subcostal uh, view with a bike cable you must demonstrate both the svc and the ivc to see the defect because a sinus venosus defect is actually not an atrial septal defect the atrial septum as you uh, normally conceptualize is intact here the defect is between the superior vena cava and the right upper pulmonary vein and because of the defect the right upper pulmonary vein ends up in the svc so there is a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection which is inherent to the anatomy of sinus venosus defect <clears throat> So that is an venous defect. Now we move to the next common defect, which is a ventricular septal defect. It's a developmental defect of IVS where there is a communication between the two ventricles. Developmentally, you know that the ventricular septum is, has a threefold source. Uh, it is formed by a fusion of the membranous septum, which is derived from the endocardial cushions the outflow septum, which is the iotico-pulmonary septum, and the muscular septum, which is the primitive ventricle septum. So these three things have to fuse together to generate a normal ventricular septum. And something going wrong in this process results in a ventricular septal defect. If you look at this cartoon, which is courtesy a device company, look at the, uh, the note that the right side is marked in blue, the left side is marked in red and um, this is the normal blood flow and he here you find a muscular defect the septum has a large defect here allowing the red left-sided oxygenated blood to come into the right heart and go into the pulmonary artery look at the color of the blood that is shown here this whereas this is blue this is more on the violetish side showing that there is an admixture And um, we like to classify VSDs depending on the locations because all VSDs are not the same. They have different implications. The first type, uh, and um, I want you to orient to this picture. Think of the heart laid out in front of you. You have chopped off the anterior wall of the heart. So this is the RA and this is the RV. Here is the tricuspid valve. So in relation to the tricuspid valve, to the pulmonary valve, and to the iota here, you are defining the location of a VST. So if your defect is under the pulmonary valve here, it's called a subpulmonic defect. Here the, it's an outlet defect because it's above the, the, the crista, which marks the separation of the infundibulum from the RV cavity. So the common terms are subpulmonary, supracrystal, because the crista marks the infundibulum from the rest of the ventricle. This is the crista. Sub, let's use the word subpulmonary or subarterial for this. This one. The this is a relatively less common defect, only about five percent. But the seventy percent of the defects are in this location. It's called perimembranous. Why is it called perimembranous? This is at the junction of where the different septa meet together. The membranous septum meets the muscular septum in this position. And um, the defect is actually not in the membranous septum, but around there. So we like the term perimembranous, and that is the commonest defect. Uh, it is labeled as number two. And the uh, inlet defect is right under the tricuspid valve, like here. If you have a defect right under the tricuspid valve, what is the inflow of the right ventricle? It is the tricuspid valve. So what is right under the tricuspid valve is called an inlet VST. Characteristically, it occurs in a Down syndrome. You can get an inlet VST in normal, chromosomally normal people also. But uh, in AV canal defect of Down syndrome, this is the characteristic VST. Defects can be far away from here. It can be in the muscular part of the septum when you call it a muscular defect. So we spoke of 
a sub arterial or sub pulmonary defect in the outflow portion below the pulmonary valve. We spoke of a perimembranous defect, which is in the uh, region below the aortic valve, below the tricuspid valve, in the region where the different septae fuse. You have the inlet defect below the tricuspid valve. You have muscular defect far away from all this. And um, VST is a common enough condition with widespread use of echo. It is becoming even more common because a small muscular defect. <coughs> I'm sorry. Small muscular defects, which you do not otherwise diagnose, you pick up from echo. And therefore, you may say that the incidence of VST now is like 50 per thousand live births. If you are looking at echocardiographically diagnosed small VSTs, but if you look at clinical, clinically relevant VSTs, uh, they are like three to five per thousand libers, accounting for about a third of all congenital heart defects. So this is the second most common congenital heart defect. The first being bicuspid aortic valve, which occurs in two percent. What happens to the hemodynamics? What dictates the hemodynamics in a VSD are how big is the VST? Now, why do you consider the size of the defect and how do you consider it? Look at it from the point of view of the left ventricle. Left ventricle should normally eject into the iota. So if you have a defect in the ventricular septum, which is as big as the aortic valve diameter, you will say the diameter of the aortic valve annulus. So if the aortic annulus diameter and the VST diameter are the same or if the VST diameter is big, that VST is large because now the LV can more easily eject across that VST into the RV. Anything less than that, we will discuss how the uh, classification goes. So that is one thing. Now, given the size of the defect, the other determinant is the pulmonary vascular resistance. The pulmonary arterioles can remain constricted. That will oppose any blood flow into the lung and in spite of a large VSD, the pulmonary blood flow is not increased or at least not increased proportionately then. When do you find this? When a baby with large VSD is born, term baby, you are seeing on day seven, there's a large VSD, but the baby is perfectly fine. This is because the pulmonary vascular resistance is fetal and it takes few weeks, four to six weeks at least, for the pulmonary vascular resistance to come down by the involution of the muscular pulmonary arterioles. So the high pulmonary vascular resistance is in preventing the large VST from shunting. Or you are seeing a 20 year old person with a large VST, he has no problem. Again, he has gone into Eisenmenger syndrome because there's a very large pulmonary uh, vascular resistance and that prevents flow. Now systemic vascular resistance is also a determinant. The higher the systemic vascular resistance, it drives flow across the VST. If the say when heart failure occurs, this is part of a self perpetuating vicious cycle. The intensely elevated systemic vascular resistance make the LV find it easier to eject across the VST into the RV. That is the basis of trying to reduce systemic vascular resistance if you have to medically treat a baby with VST and heart failure. Associated defects can also influence the shunt. LVOT obstruction, the LV pressure will go up, it will shunt across the VST, shunt will be more. RVOT obstruction, it will oppose the shunt. Tetralogy, that's what happens. There is a large VST and there is an RVOT obstruction. Additional shunts, Supposing in addition to VST, you have a PDA, the poor child has uh, two shunts to reckon with and the child goes into worse heart failure. So these are the markers and the determinants of what happens to a child with VST. The size of the defect, the pulmonary vascular resistance, the systemic vascular resistance and associated lesions. Now, what does a large VST do? It does lead to a large left to right shunt. This develops as the pulmonary vascular resistance drops and the brunt of the shunt is felt by two to three months. Remember, at birth, there is a fetal pulmonary vascular resistance. It is governed by a thick muscular cord to the pulmonary arterioles, which is got from the fetal state. This 
disappears in values in the first few weeks. And that is why a VST child even gains weight normally from say zero to one month. And um, then only, or uh, even six weeks or two months, and then only that weight gain starts getting affected because the feeding uh, is uh, interfered with. Pulmonary flow is definitely increased. This is manifested in the heart as an enlargement of the left atrium and the left ventricle. The systolic PA pressures are systemic. It has to be, if the VST is large, LV and RV pressures will be same. And what is a large VST? A VST, which is the same diameter, if not larger, relative to the aortic annulus. Even when the systolic pressures are large, when the shunt is big, the diastolic pressures are less than systemic. They will be elevated, but it is less than systemic. And uh, when a large VST goes into heart failure, the cardiac output is reduced. That is why you get cold extremities and all. The pulmonary vascular resistance in a child with a large VST is always elevated, but we have ways of grading it. The wood units is a way of quantifying pulmonary vascular resistance and uh, less than six wood units would be operable. So the, if you relate the size of the VST and the hemodynamics, a small or restrictive VST has the diameter of the defect, which is a less than a third of the size of the aortic office with normal RV and PA pressures. And um, left to right shunt, less than 1.5 is to 1. Where do we get these numbers? Uh, we, uh, let's uh, believe us that we can quantitate the pulmonary flow. So the pulmonary flow is always increased in a significant VST. And what we consider as a significant flow is if the measured pulmonary flow is one and a half times larger than the measured systemic output, that's a significant shunt. So we say that a less than uh, 1.5 is to 1 QP by QS. QP is pulmonary flow, QS is systemic flow. So in other words, for a small or restrictive VSD, restrictive means the VSD is restrictive to transmitting its pressure and flow to the right side. A small restrictive VSD is less than a third of the aortic orifice diameter, normal right heart pressures, and has a left to right shunt, which is less than 1.5 is to 1. LA and LV are normal. Now we speak of a moderate size VST. It is still restrictive in that the RV pressure is less than the systemic. So the diameter of the defect here is more than a third of the aortic annulus, but it's less than the size of the aortic office. It's definitely smaller than the aortic annulus, but it's more than a third. And if you look at the uh, pressure ratio, the RV pressure is not normal, like the small defect. It is elevated, but it's not more than two thirds of the aortic pressure. And um, for a left to right shunt, when you quantitate, it is more than 1.5 is to 1. We find that echocardiographically, if the LA LV are dilated, the shunt is more than 1.5 is to 1. Uh, we need a cath to actually quantify the, the QP and QS. Now, how does size influence him, uh, the clinical features and hemodynamics? And uh, in the large VST, the diameter is equal to or more than the size of the aortic orifice, as we have said. As a result, and LV and RV pressures are equal. If RV pressure is systemic, PA pressure is systemic. But the PA diastolic pressure is still subsystemic. And the degree of shunt will actually depend on the pulmonary vascular resistance. And as long as the pulmonary vascular resistance is only mildly elevated, LA and LV would be dilated. Whenever you find a VSD, you find the question, will this close spontaneously? There's a lot of data that we need to be familiar with. To begin with, the rate of spontaneous closure depends on the size and the location of the defect. Don't think that this is a VSD, therefore it is a chance of closure. No. Before you make that statement, you must think and find how big is the VSD and where is the VSD? A small VSD, except in the subpulmonic location, has a more than 50% chance of closure by five years of age. And by adolescence, this closure is more than 80%. In a large VSD, it is very unlikely to close spontaneously. So if you have a, seen a one month old infant with a VSD, which is the same size as the aortic annulus, we think of closing that defect 
at the earliest rather than waiting for spontaneous closure. Now we said small VST has a good chance of closure. Not so if it is subpulmonic. A subpulmonic VSD does not close unless the right coronary cusp prolapses and closes it. Now that is bad. There is no point in saying that your VST has closed because if your right coronary cusp prolapses, the aortic cusp is distorted and you get aortic regurgitation. So we would understand that a subpulmonic VSD will not close in the ordinary sense of a safe spontaneous closure. An inlet VST as the one that occurs in a Down syndrome uh, or a malaligned conoventricular VST as you see in a tetralogy practically would never close. On the other hand, a muscular VSD has an excellent chance of closure, especially if it is not large. A decrease in size of the VSD can be expected in 25% of patients with muscular VSD. So spontaneous closure is a nuanced subject. A muscular VSD, good chance of closure, particularly if it's not very big. A suppulmonic VSD will never close unless it closes by RCC prolapse, which is bad. A perimembranous VST could close. I've not listed it here. A perimembranous VST could close by a septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, which becomes adherent to it. We will call it an aneurysm of the membranous septum, even though the word aneurysm may sound alarming. It's an innocent thing in this context. All that we mean is that there is a bulge caused by the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. It will close the defect. Suppulmonic VST, we already said, perimembranous VST. It's an aneurysm of the membranous septum, which is likely to cl uh, close it. A large perimembranous VST, this is unlikely to happen. Inlet VST, practically never closes. A malaligned conoventricular VST, practically never closes. Muscular VST, good chance of closure. Now, what happens to a la VST, large VST especially? Uh, let's imagine this does not happen today. Unfortunately, it happened 50 years ago. If you are seeing a large VSD now, and what hap what is likely to happen to this child in the next one year or 10 years, 10% 10 of them will die simply due to heart failure. It can also be an overwhelming pneumonia that kills them. A 13% of them would develop infundibular obstruction. You say that they have undergone a Gasoul phenomenon. Gasoul phenomenon is the occurrence of infundibular obstruction in RVOT in a large VST. In about 6%, aortic regurgitation may develop under follow-up. This is not necessarily for large VSTs. It's also for moderate size VSTs. Aortic regurgitation is more likely to occur with a subpulmonic VSD. A subpulmonic VSD is actually under both the aortic cusp and the pulmonary cusp. The pulmonary cusp is not facing any big pressure but the aortic cusp is, and that prolapses into the defect. In a subpulmonic VST, that closure is because of right coronary cusp prolapse. In a perimembranous VST, more often a non-coronary cusp prolapses into it because of the anatomy. RCC can also prolapse into it. Much of the data of the 1950s that we got for natural history is from Paul Wood, one of the iconic figures in the history of uh, congenital heart disease and cardiology in general. In Paul Wood series, if he noted that if there is a large VSD, there is a 52% chance that they would have gone into severe pulmonary vascular disease by the end of one year itself. And the other data which is relevant to the natural history is occurrence of endocarditis. More likely to occur with a small VSD, but even there the figure is not very high. It is 1.3 per 1,000 patient years. When you have a patient with VSD, clinical evaluation is the first step in assessment. Remember, the history will be the uh, uh, presentation with feeding difficulty. I'm coming to that in a, uh, in a second. Uh, this is only to say that the clinical findings with chest X-ray and DCG can often predict the echo findings and tell you when you want to intervene. Clinically small VSD may need closure, like look uh, occurrence in a suppulmonic location or association with an RCC prolapse. How do they present? 
they present with features of heart failure. And as you know, heart failure presents as feeding difficulty. The feeding, the act of sucking the nipple is the main exertion for the small infant. And the infant, as it is sucking, it faces the equivalent of an effort dyspnea. The baby tires, bre becomes breathless and sweats and leaves the nipple. A period of rest does the baby good. It comes back to the nipple because it is hungry. The same suckle, uh, suck, rest, suck cycle repeats. And when the baby is not sucking, you can find that the baby is tachypneic. The baby is prone to recurrent respiratory tract infection. The baby certainly fails to thrive because for one, a heart failure reduces the caloric intake because of the poor feeding. The portal venous congestion as part of the right heart failure reduces the GI absorption. There is an increased catabolism in people with uh, in babies with heart failure. When you get recurrent pneumonia, it is worse. And the baby, if it has a syndromic status like the Down syndrome, that will also influence the thriving. This um, image is uh, something which uh, I have shown you before and which I had borrowed from my friend, Dr. Krishnakumar. Uh, this is the type of baby that we used to see in Kerala in the past. We hope we will not see it here, but in many parts of India, the site is common where the weight at six months is much less than the weight at birth. And you have an X-ray showing a cardiomegaly and a grossly increased pulmonary vascularity. When you examine a patient with VSD, look for dysmorphic or syndromic features. And uh, then you first note the signs of heart failure. Baby is tachycardic, tachypneic, underweight. Uh, the, on the precordium, there's a cardiomegaly. You can feel the liver. The precordial activity is more. Cardiomegaly we already referred to. When you auscultate, the first sound is normal. The second sound is closely split or single if the VSD is large. With a small VSD, you may hear a widely split second sound which normally moves. If you have a loud pansystolic murmur, that's a feature of a small VSD. A large VSD, the pressure equilibrates after the first few milliseconds of systole. So you hear only an early systolic murmur. If it's a small VSD, there is flow through that VSD all through systole and you hear a uh, long prominent murmur. So a loud pansystolic murmur is a good thing for the baby. It's a small VSD. A very short early systolic murmur in a baby in heart failure, it actually denotes a large VSD. The clinical findings would include a LV third sound and a mid diastolic flow murmur. There is a peculiar type of VSD called the Gerbode VSD. If you see this picture, remember the ventricular septum has a portion between the LV and the RA. The mitral valve is at a higher level than the tricuspid valve. So between the mitral and the tri tricuspid valve, that part of the septum, if there is a defect there, shunt will be from LV to RA. And there, even a smaller defect can cause heart failure. In that instant, there's a loud murmur elevated JVP and hepatomegaly because there is a high pressure flow into the RA cardiomegaly in the X-ray. You don't actually always need a defect in this location, but if you have a, a defect in the tricuspid valve, in addition to a defect in the, in the usual perimembranous region, part of the flow will be directly into the RA. This is called an indirect type of gerbode, and this also will present with um, heart failure disproportionate to the size of the VSD. ECG may be normal in a small VSD. It is a, an LV volume overload. Uh, it's only in a small VSD that it's normal, but anything of moderate size or more, you find LV volume overload and LVH. When do you say there is volume overload? There's voltage criteria for LVH with prominent more than three millimeter Q waves in V5A6. LA enlargement, a terminal negativity in V1 or a broad notch uh, Pre wave in lead two. And some infants with large VSD will show very prominent 
equiphasic mid-precordial V3-V4 deflections. And this is called the cats vatstel phenomenon or pattern and very characteristic of a large VST, large left direction in a baby. RVH with right axis deviation and absence of prominent left ventricular forces in an older child is a feature of a VSD with severe pulmonary vascular disease. If you can look at this ECG, I hope you can see it. They look at V1, nothing very characteristic there, but if you find V4, there's a very tall R and there's a very deep S. That is what we mean by catch vastel phenomenon. The X-ray, uh, if it's small, of course, uh, there's nothing characteristic, but otherwise you find a cardiomegaly, prominent main pulmonary artery, prominent RPA, prominent LPA, increased vascularity. And if you don't find any of these in a large VSD, the child is in trouble with a severe pulmonary hypertension. So this is what we see in a baby with a large VSD. Look at the cardiomegaly, that's evident. There is some RA enlargement, main pulmonary artery is definitely prominent. You can see the right pulmonary artery branches which are prominent and you can see that there are prominent vascular markings in the lung. Your final diagnosis is with echo, an enlargement of the LV and LA, a Doppler gradient across the VSD will tell us uh, what is the pressure like, like um, if the gradient is less than 20, it means RV and LV pressures are same. If the gradient is say like 60 or 70, it is good for the baby. It means the VST is small, so the RV pressures are small. We would look for any mitral regurgitation, a common accompaniment, any tricuspid regurgitation or aortic regurgitation, especially on follow up. MPA and branches are dilated. So these are the common features of VST. And now, if you see some of these echoes, this is the feature of a perimembranous VST. This again is a, a conoventricular or a malaligned VST, the sort of VST that you find in tetralogy, but it can occur as a left to right trend also. This is that same VST in a, a subcostal view. See the iota seems to arise from both the LV as well as the RV. This is a very large inlet VST. I look at the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve is here. There is a large defect below that. And this is a mid-muscular VSD, generally the one that's very likely to close. And uh, if you look at some case scenarios, if you have a four-month-old baby, birth weight was 3.1, now 4.2. There is history of feeding difficulty and tachypnea. On examination, you find cardiomegaly, second sound is closely split, the P2 is loud, and there's in a grade two early systolic murmur and MDM at the apex. And you find a VSD like this. This is the pulmonary valve. You can find that the defect is very close to the pulmonary valve. While this is not exactly a suppulmonic VSD, this is a perimembranous VSD with outlet extension with a very large defect there. And no doubt the baby went into heart failure. How do you deal with VSD? A small VSD, you don't need to do anything. You can follow up, say, maybe every 10 years. Uh, I'm sorry, annually for every 10 years and then uh, once in two to three years. And um, you may consider closure in a small VST if it develops endocarditis or um, uh, if it has developed a cusp prolapse. In a moderate VST, you would close by two to five years of age. You're waiting for two to five years if the baby is doing well because it may close spontaneously. But um, if it is symptomatic, you would close much earlier. And a VST with aortic cusp prolapse requires closure regardless of the size of it. If there is a definite aortic regurgitation, that's an absolute indication for closure. And when will you not close a VST? If you have large VST, no evidence of left to right shunt and if the baby is actually cyanosed, that denotes irreversible pulmonary vascular disease. And the technique of closure is surgery as the standard uh, technique. Rarely we are not able to do it because the baby may be too sick, baby may have comorbidity which prevents a major surgery, then you may ban the pulmonary artery. You're producing a degree of pulmonary artery stenosis uh, to prevent the child from flooding the lung. This is particularly so with multiple VSTs, 
VSTs which are not easily closable by the surgeon, the surgeon goes through the right atrium. He will not open the ventricle. That leaves a scar as a basis for recurrent tachycardia. And um, in patients with borderline operability, the surgeons have been many innovative techniques. They may leave part of the whole day. They may close it in such a way that if the right heart pressure increases, it can shun right to left uh, or you may not do anything. So there are uh, possibilities for patients with elevated PVR and borderline operability, but it's a double edged thing. There are selected cases where today device closure is tried. Uh, this is generally Really for bigger children weighing bigger than 8 kg, uh, a pulmonary vascular resistance should be acceptable and they should have a good shunt, particularly useful for a mid-muscular VSD and uh, in selected cases of perimembranous VSD also. This inoperable VSD case scenario, 10-year-old boy, absolutely no symptoms. He has no cardiomegaly, single second sound, constant pulmonary ejection click and no murmur and an X-ray like this. His, it is not possible to, uh, not that it's not possible, it is contraindicated to close this VSD. You have to put him on targeted pulmonary hypertension medication. Uh, I think I'll, I'll stop here. The other defects I'll take in another class. Uh, this ASD and VSD are common things that you see, and there should be time for discussion. Uh, in my next lecture, we will continue with the other left to right shunts. Today, I would like you to ask questions related to this. Thank you. These are common lesions that you encounter. Therefore, it's very important that um, this discussion is more interactive. So please feel free to ask questions. Please go ahead. I you can ask questions or you can chat. No questions? Sinus venosus ASD, should we take special views for your echo? Yes, the subcostal view, the subcostal bicable view. See, if you uh, are using the usual pediatric way of imo imaging, if you have the marker turned inferiorly and if you are looking at the echo, then only you will get the subcostal view, bicable view. If you don't get that, you will miss a sinus venosus ASD. So when you have clinically diagnosed ASD, your echo in the traditional views have shown dilated RARV, you are looking for an ASD and the atrial septum looks intact, go to the subcostal view, take a bicable view, and you will find the sinus venosus ASD. ASD of what size is considered significant in a newborn? Uh, I would say more than eight millimeters, but the point is the Look at it this way. An ASD less than 5 millimeters is generally not significant. An ASD which is valvular is generally not significant. One problem in assessing the size of ASD, if there is something which is filling the left atrium, let's say the child has a PDA, child has an iotic stenosis, the child has a more serious obstructive lesion on the left heart, LA pressures are high and therefore even a small ASD will shun vigorously. In a small baby, what I always insist, if you find a PF4, a small AST is shunting vigorously, look for something which is filling that left atrium. Uh, if you take away those conditions and an AST is an isolated finding, an AST less than 5 millimeter is generally smaller. The smaller it is below 5 millimeter, the safer it is to say that it will close. But there's no harm in repeating an echo after six months or one year. Now, I find another question. Uh, can there be a thrill in a small VSD? Absolutely. After all, what is malady D. Roger? If you are still familiar with the terminology, 
It's a loud pansystolic murmur with a thrill at the left sternal border. It's a small VSD which is associated with a vigorous flow across that which is generating that thrill. It is a smaller VSD which will produce a murmur and a thrill. What is is the normal size of the aortic annulus that depends on the age. Remember, we have C scores for everything. Uh, but having said that, if you are looking at a 3 kg, uh, the average weight of a baby, a 3 kg baby, you will have a, an aortic annulus between 6 and 8 millimeter, more likely 6 to 7. The, the, uh, but rather than compare the VST to an empirical aortic annulus size, you can always take the actual aortic annulus in the baby and compare it with the VST. Anything else? What is the present endocarditis prophylaxis? There is difficulty in getting benzathine pencil. Ah, that question uh, is a tough one. In that, what do you use benzathine penicillin for? Benzathine penicillin has nothing to do with endocarditis. Please consider that as a, uh, what should I say, in bold letters. Infective endocarditis prophylaxis and rheumatic fever prophylaxis are absolutely different. Giving regular low dose penicillin is against the principle of endocarditis prophylaxis. Endocarditis prophylaxis means the patient is undergoing a procedure like a dental extraction or a urogenital procedure, and there is a possibility that bacteria resident in that location could enter the bloodstream of the patient. What do you do? You cover the baby with an appropriate antibiotic appropriate for the location where the intervention is being done with an appropriate antibiotic in a very high dose for two or three doses. That is endocarditis prophylaxis. Benzathine penicillin is a problem for rheumatic fever. Now, that's a different question. In a different location, I can answer problem related to benzathine penicillin, but here the concept is important. Benzathine penicillin and um, regular daily administration of penicillin has nothing to do with endocarditis prophylaxis. Endocarditis prophylaxis is timely administration of two or three doses of heavy dose antibiotics for a interventional procedure. Any other question? Any other question? I found that the medical colleges have been silent. I'll give you 30 seconds to type in your next question, otherwise I'll wind up. Okay, Amrita, then I think they have run out of questions, so we will wind up. Okay, sir. So my okay. next lecture, when come falls in next month, will be a continuation of this, referring okay. to conditions which we have not discussed today. I actually okay. wanted to spend maximum time on ASD and VSD to give time for questions. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And thank you all the institutions for your participation.